and welcome to AIG Omicron series part 2. My name is Nageshwar Reddy, I work at the AIG hospitals. Two days back, we did our first webinar on Omicron as it just started coming into our country. Most of the experience at that time was what was available from Africa and from UK. Information which we transmitted in the webinar. For the last 10 days, we also have now considerable information coming from our country, from our institute. And there is also considerable difference in a variety of uh, uh, agents that are causing this. So, what we thought is we will update you on with this new webinar on uh, Omicron. The first thing that has happened is that uh, just to clarify, when Omicron first came, it was thought to be the native virus. Soon we came to know that it actually has three lineages and all of them simultaneously came from the same mother virus. It was initially BA1 which actually came in South Africa and UK but was rapidly taken over by BA2 which is the current lineage that we are seeing now. In India, BA2 has overtaken BA1 and it is believed that BA2 is the predominant Omicron lineage that we have. If you look at the mutations, they are about 16 BA1 but 18 BA2. So what this has resulted in increased transmissibility about 20 percent more with BA2, however the symptoms are still very mild and more importantly the immune escape that you see in BA1 is similar with BA2. So in all senses BA1 and BA2 are similar except that there is increased transmissibility that occurs with this virus. So what does this mean in our country? This is very interesting, if we actually see what happened in South Africa and correlate with what is going to happen in our country. If you assume that all the viruses start at the same point of time, you can see what happens here that Omicron goes up rapidly and comes down rapidly. Whereas if you look at Delta for example here, you see it plateaus, takes a long time and then comes down. With BA2, it is expected that this peak is going to be faster, downfall is going to be faster. So what we can expect epidemiologically is that after a period of time, our peak which is actually just probably reached the peak just now in India is going to dramatically come down and hopefully by 4 weeks time we will be seeing less and less of these cases. The other important thing again if you extrapolate data from South Africa is look at uh, the different waves and the death rate. You see with uh, the beta and delta the death rates were significantly high whereas with Omicron although the incidence is high the death rate is low and now over the last 4 or 6 weeks experience in our country has told us that this is exactly similar that we are seeing less death rates but more commonly we are seeing these cases. So what we are going to do in this webinar is to discuss on these five very important topics in which new information has just come in over the last one week or ten days. The first topic is going to be on interpretation of RT-PCR results. Uh, this is the area there is considerable confusion. In fact, our first diagnosis of Omicron especially BA1 was made on the fact that S gene was absent when you did a RT-PCR test. But Omicron BA2 which is overtaken now completely has an S gene positivity. So how do you differentiate a po S gene positive Omicron versus a Delta virus which is still present in small quantities and this for the clinician becomes extremely important because the treatment changes we ex for example use monoclonal antibodies against Delta, we do not use it against Omicron and therefore to allay this confusion and to give you a definitive uh, way of how to approach these patients, we have a first talk on interpreting RT-PCR results. In spite of the fact that Omicron BA2 is very mild, some patients because of comorbidities, age and probably HLA type are becoming critically ill in our own uh, ICU for example, we have about 20 such patients who have various comorbidities. How do you manage critically ill patients? This is another important especially with Omicron. And if you look at Omicron wave situation in our country, you will see that unlike the previous delta wave and so on where children are not affected, with Omicron BA2, significant percentage of children are getting affected. Now this has become very important because the parents are worried should these children go to school or not, what is the medical pattern in them, can we prevent this disease in them and so on. So this will be the third topic of discussion. The other area where we are looking into is the so called long COVID. 
is there a long omicron also long long covid this is i think uh, something which uh, we are still not sure because traditionally by definition it should be more than 4 weeks old and we are still get just getting into it but some patients who have had omicron although the illness is mild are becoming extremely um, weak increased fatigability will these people go into a long omicron type of picture this is of concern and this is what we have to look into and of course uh, finally the vaccines i think some important uh, data has been presented last time on vaccines how va actually protect and this is uh, some data from our institute just come out going to going to press now uh, from dr deepika the head of biochemistry department and this is some very interesting data actually uh, she looked at uh, thousands of patients who had uh, S1, S2 antibody level that is neutralizing antibody levels done on various stages. They are patients who had a single vaccine, uh, those who had only infection with the previous Delta virus, those who had uh, double vaccine, those who had booster and those who had hybrid illness that is they had uh, illness and afterwards had a vaccine and finally those who had a vaccine still had breakthrough infection and you will notice from this very interesting data that those people who had an infection and a vaccine either way before or after are the ones who had the highest amount of antibodies in them. These are also the people who had very strong T cell immunity in them and therefore they are the ones who are protected from developing future types of corona infections whatever the variants and less of Omicron also. But you also notice that booster also significantly improves what is happening. Now we know all this data but what is very interesting is the new types of vaccines that are coming on there seems to be a specific omicron vaccine that's coming up and we'll have we'll have a discussion on this so finally i think it's very important remember that we still emphasize on vaccination marks because vaccine not only prevents you from getting the infection but also probably helps you in getting some of the medals so we'll start with the topic now which is going to be on how to diagnose Omicron by RT-PCR infection. Again, before we actually start our topic, I would like to emphasize that this is a webinar where uh, we would like to uh, have a discussion, but unfortunately this is the virtual one, so it is very difficult to have that. So what we are going to do is we are going to put an official address of the webinar on the, on the screen there. Uh, you can ask questions. In fact, last after the last webinar, we had a lot of questions coming into this academics AIG hospitals. You can send your queries to this and we will uh, send back answers to each one of you individually. So, let us start with our first uh, talk which is going to be given by Dr. Shashikala, Director of our Molecular Biology Department and she is going to talk to on how to interpret RT-PCR uh, reports uh, that are coming in now. Dr. Shashikala. Very good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this Omicron series 2. So now, we have been through the pandemic since 2 years and we are now in the th middle of the third wave which is dominated by Omicron and which has replaced the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2. It is very well established that Omicron has lot of mutations when compared to Delta in the spike protein. As you see here, all the yellow spots are the mutations that are seen in the spike protein. The question here is whether we can use the regularly uh, used kits for detecting this Omicron or not. So what are available to us is the rapid antigen test kit and the real time PCR kit. The rapid antigen test kit uses uh, or targets, detects the proteins while the real time PCR kits detect the RNA, viral RNA. So the rapid antigen kits also detect the Omicron because it, it, they use mostly the nucleocapsid protein for a detection of the virus. The sensitivity of the detection is 50 percent. Even with the earlier variants, the sensitivity was about 50 percent by real uh, rapid antigen test. So, we can also use this uh, rapid antigen test to detect Omicron. So, if you look at the real time PCR, the nasal swabs are collected, RNA is isolated, DNA is amplified and then it is quantified, then reported in terms of 
CT values. If the CT value is greater than 35, it has to be considered as definitely negative and as per guidelines of ICMR, if it is below 35, it should be considered as positive. So, of the two methods, the rapid antigen as well as the RT-PCR kit, RT-PCR is more sensitive and uh, it is about uh, 80 to 90 percent sensitivity while the rapid antigen is only 50 percent and it also denotes the current infection. But here we need to have a laboratory facility and trained personnel to do the real time PCR properly. So, we know that there are large number of mutations in the spike protein in the Omicron. This, if you look at this picture, this is the original uh, wild variety of the virus. This has got central, this has got central genome that is in the center it is the RNA surrounded by the nucleocapsid protein, encapsulated by the membrane and the envelope proteins. Now, you see the pro pro projections which are the spike protein through which the virus enters the host cells. Usually the RT-PCR kits, RT-PCR kits usually use the genes coding for these proteins and the genes present in the viral genome. The S gene is used for detecting the spike, nucleocapsid N gene, E gene for envelope protein and the viral genome by open reading frame genes as well as the polymerase genes. These are usually used to detect and then if two genes are to be present to be uh, considered as the sample to be considered as positive and if the CT value is less than 30, it is definitely positive and if the CT value is between 30 and 35, it is to be repeated again after a day or two. And if the CT value is greater than 35, the sample is definitely negative. So now here what we need to understand is greater the CT value, lesser the viral load. If the, if the CT value say for example CT value is 16 to 20, the viral load is very high is to be considered. And if the CT value is more than say 35, 38, 39, it is definitely negative and between 30 and 35 the viral load is very low. Thus, this needs to be followed if it is between 30 and 35 to see if the patient is progressing or uh, meaning if the virus is multiplying or the mul virus is coming down. So, how does it uh, affect, how does the mutations in the virus affect the detection of Omicron? It is in South Africa in the month of November, they noticed that the S gene was not amplifying in these RT-PCR reactions. Then they have sequenced the entire genome of the viral samples and they noticed that this is a different variant, not the Delta variant and then the name came it as, then it was named as Omicron. It was, so this was not amplifying because of the large mutations, the S gene was not getting amplified. So, then they understood and they and uh, it was decided that S gene drop to be considered as uh, Omicron. If there is no S gene amplification, the sample is to be considered as to be Omicron is to be present. Very soon it was also noticed that S gene started appearing in some of the samples. Then the ambiguity came whether this is a Delta variant or the Omicron variant. If there is a drop in the S gene, it has to be considered as Omicron, but appearance of this S gene again in some of the samples uh, created a confusion. So then what had happened? People had to develop or the investigators had to develop methods to identify uh, the sample with S gene positivity. So what do we do at AIG? We developed or an algorithm where we have, now we test all the samples using a kit called TACPATH which has S gene in amplification in the kit. Many kits do not have this S gene because it works out to be little costly, but we at AAG we, we make sure that we do use this TACPATH kit, a real time PCR kit for testing COVID samples. 
Now once the sample is positive, sample will be considered as positive if there is N gene positivity and if there is ORF positivity. Whether S gene is positive or not, we will have to look at it carefully. And if, if the sample is S gene negative, then it is definitely Omicron. N gene positive, ORF positive, S gene negative, the sample is definitely Omicron and it has to be now considered as the sub lineage BA1. Now, if N gene is positive, RF is positive and S gene is also positive. So, how what should we think about it? Is it delta or is it Omicron? So, this needs again, we know that the delta has specific mutations and the Omicron has unique mutations and these mutations need to be confirmed by specific mutation detection. Now, the delta is known to have a mutation in at L452 position which is lacking in Omicron and the Omicron has a mutation in the 954th position which is lacking in delta. So, we need to have we developed a method uh, using the primers and the probe designed by the CCMB people and we use this 954 mutation to differentiate whether it is delta or omicron. So, now we first test the attack path, look at whether it is S gene positive or negative, S gene positive, N ORF positive, then we go further for specific mutation, amplification and detection. If 954 is positive, we will consider it as omicron. If 954 is positive then we consider it as delta further can be confirmed by the um, amplification of 452 mutation. So, what are the other kits that are available? There are two kits which are approved by ICMR, one kit developed by Tata group which is available in the market since 12th January 2022. We have no much experience with this kit, we still the real world data is still to emerge and there is another kit developed by Central Drug Research Institute Lucknow called OM which is also ICMR approved, but this kit has to be still come into the market in the month of February. Bo those, both these kits use the S gene drop and the specific mutation amplification to detect Omicron but still the data has to emerge. So, with the successful collaboration with CCMB, all the patient samples we are sequenced at CCMB six, uh, under the able guidance of Dr. Karthik and then the samples were considered uh, see in the month of October it was all delta, you see the blue color to be delta and the red pink is uh, Omicron. Omicron started emerging only in the month of December in India. Towards the end of December, we had about 8 percent to be Omicron and the remaining to be the Delta and in within no time, say 4 weeks time, now the Omicron has become 94 percent and only 6 percent is Delta. This is confirmed by sequencing as well as our algorithm that we use at AAG hospitals. Now, what is the importance of knowing the strain? The importance of knowing the strain in the clinical management will be discussed by the next speaker. Hopefully, with the humongous efforts by the governments and the healthcare professionals, the virus becomes weaker and weaker and the pandemic starts becoming endemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shikala, for this very a nice pathways that have shown us how to differentiate delta from omicron especially the ba2 variety that we see now this differentiation is extremely important and to emphasize a simple rt pcr followed by a mutation study will tell us whether you're dealing with an omicron or delta and uh, the total results can be available in about six hours time so the clinician can then take uh, uh, a decision whether to give uh, monoclonal antibodies or not as we have heard majority of the cases now at least what we have seen at AAG 94 percent 
our Omicron BA2 variety and hopefully the peak will come down very shortly. Although majority of these cases are mild in presentation, do not require any treatment, just home care, there are some with comorbidities who are developing a little more serious infection, very small percentage compared to Delta, but nevertheless they are there and these have to be man managed properly. To tell us how to manage these cases, we have Dr. Vishwanath, the head of department of a pulmonology, huge experience with these type of patients and is going to talk to us on this. Dr. Vishwanath. Very good afternoon everyone. In the next few minutes, I will be discussing about the management of uh, critically ill COVID patients in this uh, current Omicron era. So, uh, it is a well known fact that Omicron is predominantly restricted to the upper respiratory tracts. It probably causes only the upper respiratory infections and bronchitis. It is rare to cause pneumonia. And from the data from South Africa and also from the uh, our own data, it is a fact that Omicron mainly causes the milder infections and lesser hospitalization. This is in part due to the intrinsically lesser virulence of the virus and in part due to the development of COVID specific immunity which happened because of the widespread vaccination campaign and also because of the previous infections in the first and the second wave. So knowing that it causes mainly the mild disease, should there be a reason for us to discuss the management of critically ill patients in this Omicron wave, that is the third wave? The answer is clear yes, because uh, though Omicron is predominant strain in all over in India and, and in the world, Delta still constitutes a significant portion in some of the states and a proportion of the population is still unvaccinated. We know that 95% of our population is uh, fully vaccinated with two doses and 70, uh, is fully vaccinated with uh, 70, so only 75% of our uh, population is fully vaccinated with the two doses. So, still 25% of the population is at risk of developing a severe infection when they develop a COVID. And it is also a known fact that immunosuppressed patients have a tendency to uh, develop lesser immunity compared to the immunocompetent patients. So, this puts them at higher risk of developing a severe disease. The data from the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare compared uh, taken at the time of the peak of the second wave and at the third wave peak uh, recently has shown that the deaths were significantly higher in the delta wave 3600 and this is a single day status basically and uh, the number of deaths were here 435 and similarly the number of cases were almost similar 4 lakhs and the 3 lakhs cases but here if you see look at the vaccination status 3 percent of the population is uh, vaccinated during the delta wave whereas now the 75 percent of population is fully vaccinated. So, for us to understand what should be the treatment options uh, for deciding for both the stable as well as the critically ill patients, we should there are three important things which we should understand before going for the treatment thing. First thing is, is strain testing needed in the current scenario for the uh, deciding the treatment options. That is a, a million dollar question. The reason is because uh, everybody now as soon as we say that uh, RT-PCR is positive, we keep asking what whether there is S gene, whether it is Omicron or whether it is uh, Delta. A recent guidance from the NIH states that if Omicron represents the majority, that is more than 80 percent of the infections in a region, so it is expected that the currently available monoclonal antibody region CoV, that is the casirumab and imdimumab will be futile and it is not worth using it. Similarly, the treatment should be aimed at uh, targeting the Omicron strain. And the second question is, even if the there are multiple kits, uh, the two kits which are approved for uh, differentiation of uh, all the Omicron strains, they are not widely available and they are just coming into the market. And the currently available kits have an uh, problem with them because we are not able to identify the BA2 lineage of the COVID strain with the currently available kits. So, in the clinician, when a clinician sees the S gene present, sometimes there is a uh, tendency among the clinicians and also the patients to ask for uh, monoclonal antibody. Dr. Shashikala has clearly dealt that currently the BA2 variant can have S gene and so S gene presence does not mean that it is Delta and then we should jump to give monoclonal antibody. The the important thing is the uh, which is the predominant strain if you are not able to do an uh, strain testing in your uh, uh, setting. So, as per the GHMC data in Telangana, we have the Omicron constitutes around 92 percent and again the similar data from the INSACOG uh, consortium shows that nearly 75 percent of the samples recently submitted to the global body were uh, Omicron. And 
you can see the trend in different states. Telangana around 95% of uh, cases of Omicron, 5% are the other cases. And if you look at uh, Karnataka, still 67.5% of the cases are Omicron, but still a significant 26% of the population have Delta cases. So similarly, the proportion of cases is different in different states. So coming to the treatment options which are available to us, in the mild to moderate disease, we have antivirals to reduce the risk of progression. And severe disease, we have steroids and immunomodulatory agents like baricitinib and tocilizumab. So these are all the antivirals which are available to us. The first two options, Paxlovid and Sotrovim are not available in India. And the Remdesivir and Molnupiravir are available in India. Remdesivir can be given for a duration of 3 to 5 days uh, depending upon the sickness of the patient. And Molnupiravir, though approved by the DCGI, is not recommended in the ICMR guidelines. And that is a separate topic for discussion in itself. And these are the steroids, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone. Doses is a common uh, thing which we have been using for the last uh, one and a half to two years. And these are the immunomodulators which are approved for use in uh, severe COVID. So both steroids and baricitinib have got a different uh, pathway. We know that uh, steroids act at multiple pathways. They act at the nuclear level and suppress the nuclear factor, kappa beta. Baricitinib is a jack inhibitor. So combining steroid and baricitinib would give us a best result and then would decrease the ICU stay and the NIV requirement and the invasive ventilation requirement. So these are the two important guidelines which have taken into consideration for forming our uh, protocol, the ICMR and the recently updated NIH guidelines. Coming to the uh, which we have prepared at our institute. In the low risk patients, it's mainly the symptomatic treatment. If the patient is improving, continue treatment. And if the patient is not improving after, say, three to four days of treatment, then you need to switch to the high risk algorithm. So most of the data for the high risk individuals, that is the role of antivirals, have come from the trials in the unvaccinated individuals. So they have shown that using early antivirals in the first week reduces the risk of progression in these patients. However, most of our population is now vaccinated. So the magnitude of benefit which we get from early antivirals may be lesser compared to the benefit which we got in the trial patients. So in real scenario now, I, what we feel is the, in the high risk means the unvaccinated individuals and patients who are having persistent symptoms of high grade fever and cough which are not responding more than three days with elevated inflammatory markers are the ones who are high risk. We have seen lot of high risk patients like diabetics, hypertensives, patients with uh, chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease who came with very mild disease and who were not give, offered any treatment. These patients did very well and improved very well. So the high risk for Delta may not be really high risk for Omicron. So it is mainly the clinical presentation which is important for this patients. So if you have a high risk patient who is presenting with uh, significant symptoms, wherever feasible in a setting, uh, we need to do a strain testing. If strain testing is not possible in, as in most areas, uh, like in the districts and the peripheries, uh, so you need not worry that you are not able to do the strain testing. To us, uh, at least the remdesivir, which can be used for three to five days, especially in high risk symptomatic individuals. Suppose if you are able to get a strain testing and you are able to differentiate whether it is an Omicron or non-Omicron, then again, as I told you, the remdesivir and molnupiravir are the treatment of treatment options for us. And coming to a word on molnupiravir, though it is not approved, uh, clinicians can use their discretion when using molnupiravir, especially in settings uh, where the patient is high risk, symptomatic have logistic issues of uh, procuring remdesivir are not able to get admitted in a hospital to, to take remdesivir. Molnupiravir can be given for a duration of five days and telling about the uh, possible complications and uh, suggesting them to use for contraception, especially in the high-risk individuals. And if it's a non-Omicron, we know that monoclonal antibodies significantly reduces progression of the disease in these patients and uh, it ha prevents hospitalizations then deaths, especially when monoclonal antibodies are given to understand that most of us already developed a good immune response to the vaccines. So there is a possibility that they have already developed good antibodies, in which case our monoclonal antibodies may not be very, very helpful. So some of the data from the studies have shown that a tighter more than 500 has got a good virus neutral capacity. One more uh, study has shown that the cutoff is 100. So our, our own data in our institute has shown that a cutoff less than 100 
patients have breakthrough infection. So at least we can reason conclude that a titer more than 500 is neutralize the virus. A titer which is less than 500 may not be good to neutralize the virus and these patients require monoclonal antibody to be given. And thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. That uh, AAG algorithm in treating patients with uh, severe Omicron infection and I think uh, again we have had considerable uh, experience with this and also thank you for pointing out clearly that high risk in Delta may be different than high risk in Omicron because high risk for Omicron is not just age, comorbidities and so on. It is in addition more than three days of symptoms like fever. So, if you have high risk features plus fever or other symptoms of more than three days, then these patients would warrant treatment with antivirals and of course, you look at other factors, if they are severe, they get into ICU. This is again very clearly an algorithm that has been developed after considerable experience and that is what we are following here. Uh, our next topic is something which has uh, come up recently with Omicron. I think uh, this is a topic of interest for everybody, especially those who have children because uh, we find that children are affected significantly uh, with this uh, virus. Uh, what happens to these children? How do we protect them? To discuss all these factors, we have Dr. Rajshekar Reddy, consultant pediatrics uh, in our department of pediatrics at AAG. Rajshekar. Uh, good, good evening everyone. Uh, my topic is Omicron in children. Uh, usual how Omicron affects children as uh, children are uh, most of them are unvaccinated as they are not eligible for vaccination. Uh, we will see how Omicron affects in children. Uh, uh, as we have already seen in first wave and second wave, COVID leads to mild or asymptomatic infections in children. There are many hypotheses why it is mild or asymptomatic infections in children. There are possible reasons are more they have more efficient uh, local airway immune responses, they have better thymic function and higher systemic inflammatory response. There is one more uh, hypothesis. Uh, COVID uh, to penetrate uh, COVID virus into uh, tissue, they need uh, they ne their spikes need to attach to AC2 receptors. Usual children have reduced AC2 receptors in nasal nas mucosa. Uh, this is this is one more hypothesis uh, for a mild or asymptomatic infection in children. Uh, coming to Omicron event, how it will affect? We'll see in next slides. Uh, scientifically, we have only two papers at till now. Uh, one is from South Africa. Uh, there it was uh, for, uh, collected uh, data collected retrospectively from lab and uh, the compared between beta and delta in Omicron uh, and they uh, inquired about uh, hospitalization and severity of illness. So, coming to all ages, uh, hospitalization was uh, proportionately decreased from beta to delta and, and Omicron and severity was, uh, it is almost similar in beta and delta and uh, decreased uh, dramatically in Omicron. Uh, what about, what happened to age less than 20 years? It was, uh, hospitalization was more or less similar in uh, beta, delta and Omicron and severity also proportionately it was the uh, same in beta and delta and Omicron. And one more study in uh, US, they collected in, uh, uh, they collected data retrospectively in under 5 years uh, age group and uh, they did propensity score matching and uh, compared uh, Omicron cohort and Delta cohort in 1 is to 1 ratio. And the outcomes measured are emergency department visit, hospitalization and ICU admissions and mechanical ventilations. In uh, all four outcomes are uh, very low risk for uh, in Omicron when you, they compare to Delta cohort. So, as of now, there is no data from um, India, but uh, our institute uh, we collected from last four months uh, in uh, October, November, which is predominant by Delta variant. Uh, out of 474 children who came uh, uh, came to a favor clinic or admitted for some other reason, 16 came positive, and out of 16, only one is hospitalized due to COVID. In January, which is uh, predominantly uh, uh, predominant by Omicron variant, out of 195 cases, 64 came positive, which is uh, around 32 percent. Out of 64, five cases are uh, hospitalized and uh, all none required hospitalization. So, by looking at this data, uh, Omicron looks uh, very mild or asymptomatic in children. So, treatment part, uh, it is uh, more or less same as uh, previous uh, other uh, variants. Uh, treatment is mainly symptomatic like uh, antipyretics and uh, supportive management uh, like hydration. Uh, as of now, in absence of safety and efficacy, the uh, use of antivirus like remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies are not recommended for children less than 18 years. So, even though acute COVID is uh, mild, uh, some uh, some children develop post-infectious hyperinflammatory syndrome uh, like um, a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, it can be serious. Usually, it is presence after one month uh, after peak curve. So, any children presents with, uh, after post-COVID, presents with fever, rash and uh, abdominal pain, loose tools, they, sh uh, they should be very cautious, they should immediately consult a local pediatrician. 
and uh, as of now there is no data uh, post omicron uh, uh, missy data uh, my take home messages are uh, the available data from other countries and our uh, our institute experience says there are uh, direct effects of disease by omicron variant is very less severe however the indirect effects of uh, are uh, considerable like child mental physical social due to school closures and missed vaccinations and neglect of other diseases so vaccinating children at the earliest whenever they are eligible vaccinating the adults staying with children with booster and protein doses not only protects adults it also indirectly protects children so uh, there are so many rumors are uh, spreading in social media about vaccines uh, there is only hope to endemic pandemic probably vaccination thank you thank you rashekar uh, i think giving that very optimistic message that in children this disease is very mild i think parents can be encouraged to tell the send their children to the schools and hopefully vaccination for them is going to come in fact in our country there are two trials going on in children one of them also is for children as young as 2 years so once these vaccines come children can be very safely protected but as of now from the experience that we have seen in our institute the disease for children is extremely mild none of them have required um, uh, a long term hospitalization or even an intensive care now we come to the next topic which again although doesn't look very obvious but may become in future and this is the long covid that we seen with delta are we going to see with omicron what is the initial experience with this and to talk this uh, for us is dr uh, madhuri radhakrishna dr uh, madhuri has actually had a huge experience with uh, looking after long covid patients in the previous pandemic and she runs a long covid opd in a hospital dr madhuri thank you sir So I'm here to speak about this topic long covid with omicron would it be a future concern as of now we do not have any definite data on the incidence or prevalence of long covid with omicron as yet what we can do is to evaluate the known risk factors for developing post covid syndrome or long covid with the other variants seen so far and compare those risk factors with the omicron with the omicron variant So our AIG data, which, as Sir said, we have taken from our long COVID clinic. This data is based in on patients presented in the last year, 2021. We found that the most common symptoms which they presented with were fatigue, constitutional features like loss of weight and loss of appetite, persistent neurological features in the form of insomnia, giddiness, and headache, persistent musculoskeletal complaints in the form of myalgias and arthralgias. around 10% of our cohort went on to develop frank arthritis and persistent pulmonary symptoms in the form of cough and persistent breathlessness the most common comorbidities which we found in our cohort were type 2 diabetes hypertension and hypothyroidism international data a study published in nature medicine in 2021 evaluated the data which was self reported by more than 4100 persons in a covid symptom study app in populations based in the uk us and sweden they found that older age presence of more than 5 symptoms in the first week of illness bronchial asthma female gender and higher body mass index were risk factors for developing long covid trying to extrapolate this these risk factors to omicron presence as the symptomatology of omicron is milder The presence of more than five symptoms in first week of illness is very less seen in Omicron. The other factors continue to be non-modifiable risk factors. So, considering this, we might say that the risk of developing long COVID would appear to be less with Omicron. Regarding what we have learned regarding the pathophysiology of long COVID from previous waves, a study published in 2022 in Nature Immunology has said that. there is evidence of persistent immunological dysfunction for up to 8 months following even initially mild to moderate sars cov2 infections they have identified persistent immunological dysfunctions in the form of elevated pro inflammatory cytokines persistently elevated interferons and activated t cells now as omicron is less severe than the other variants we can hypothesize that this immunological dysfunction may be less with omicron again possibly allowing us to say the risk of developing long omicron long omicron would be less as compared to other variants a study which is in preprint compared in the journal cell has found four factors predicting the development for long covid this study says that 
the initial high viral load of the SARS-CoV-2 infection, reactivation of latent viruses in the form of Epstein-Barr virus viremia or they even considered cytomegalovirus viremia in those who had gut symptoms in initial COVID infection, the development of autoantibodies and presence of type 2 diabetes were major risk factors for developing long COVID. Trying to extrapolate this to Omicron, presence of diabetes and the viral load would be non-modifiable risk factors. Now, the reactivation of latent viruses and development of autoantibodies here would be expected as a result of persistent immuno immunological dysfunction. Again, hypothesizing that we expect less inflammatory response with Omicron, possibly these two factors might be at a lower level with Omicron compared to other previous strains like Delta. Maybe it could lead to a lesser risk. Now, the other factor which has uh, been shown uh, by our pulmonologist saying that vaccines have definitely protected in the severity of clinical infections, whether vaccines would protect against the development of long Omicron. The data we have, uh, I quote a study in Israel in which they had performed an online survey in 951 infected and more than 2400 uninfected individuals. They considered uninfected individuals because sometimes the symptoms of long COVID are vague like fatigue, loss of weight, loss of appetite, insomnia. They may even be reported by persons who have never been affected by COVID. So they compared these two cohorts and of those who were infected, 67% of the people were vaccinated either before or after their infection with COVID virus. They found that the most common symptoms were fatigue, headache, weakness and persistent muscle pain. And fully vaccinated persons were less likely to report post-COVID symptoms suggesting that vaccines have a role to play in preventing the development of long COVID. So to summarize from the available data, as of now we do not have enough data yet to say whether we would develop, we have, would have an entity called long Omicron because we would define it as saying the persistence of symptoms after four weeks after symptom onset. Maybe the next few weeks will give us more information. The available observations, however, seem to show that a significant proportion of people do have persisting fatigue, myalgias and back pain even after recovery from the infection. Omicron does cause milder symptoms, but the possibility of long COVID exists even with the Omicron strain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhuri, for again uh, the optimistic picture that Omicron seems to paint that uh, although you can get mild symptoms in form of fatigue, muscle pain, chance of a severe long COVID seems to be less. And there's some data coming in suggesting that at least uh, we have experience in South Africa for eight weeks now and for about six weeks from UK to suggest that this is not such a major problem. And again, I think vaccination is something that actually helps us here. Coming to the vaccines, I think some very exciting data is coming on, especially in the last few weeks. And to discuss the vaccine picture with us is uh, Dr. Mithun, who is the director of uh, hepatology services. Mithun. which is of common public interest uh, which is basically uh, vaccines in the pipeline particularly uh, when we are talking about Omicron. So we know that there is a huge list of approved vaccines in India uh, starting from Covishield and Covaxin and uh, ending up with the recent approval of vaccines from Biological E and Novavax. So then if there are so many vaccines available, some even available for children around the age of above 12 years, some around above the age of 15 years. So why do we actually need to discuss vaccines in pipeline? So maybe we have not reached the ideal vaccine. So what is an ideal vaccine? An ideal vaccine is one which is considered to have a very high efficiency. Maybe we would like to have a 100% efficient vaccine which provides a lifelong or long-term immunity with minimum adverse effect and a vaccine which is stable under various conditions like it has to be transported sensitive to light and transportation. If something like a polio vaccine which is easy to administer either orally or an intranasal vaccine uh, would be great and it should be available in unlimited quantities and it should be cheap. So have we reached any of this? Efficiency we possibly haven't reached yet, but and so also the lifelong protection 
coming to the adverse effects we are almost there these vaccines have been found to be safe uh, there are still many vaccines which we are not being able to use in india because of the temperature cold chain that needs to be maintained uh, easy to administer oral vaccines are under development and to be available in unlimited quantities we should not be specific to india india has unlimited possibly at this point of time but we need to think of the world as a whole coming to the cheap so the issue is that as of now majority of these vaccines are being paid by the government of india and so when people will have to start paying from the pocket that is when we know what is cheap and what is uh, costly so uh, we need to discuss vaccines in pipeline because vaccine immunity wanes over time and so possibly the discussion comes is do we need a new vaccine or an omicron specific vaccine or a booster which is specific from omicron uh, we all know that the booster dose can definitely improve the t cell immunity which can prevent uh, infection with a uh, severe infection with omicron or any other variant so which are the vaccines which are under development this is what is called a vaccine war so there are 149 vaccines in the preclinical state uh, 42 vaccines in phase 1 trials 44 vaccines in phase 2 trials 40 in phase 3 uh, 23 of these vaccines are in use and there are 10 vaccines which are in the post marketing surveillance phase 4 studies so the next few slides i would like to talk something which is exciting which everyone wants to hear uh, whether we can have an oral covid vaccine something like a pill we can buy from the pharmacy and just pop in so this is a study uh, which showed that this uh, company which has named it as a vaxert so it has a covid 19 vaccine uh, which is in the form of a pill which is in an enteric coated tablet uh, to escape the acidity of the stomach and it is released in the small intestine and it takes the help of the small intestinal mucosal and gut immunity to produce a long-term uh, immune response and this has been studied in phase two studies and the results are promising data from the hong kong based dream tech also has developed a vaccine which is in the form of a capsule where billions of bacillus subtilis spores are covered with receptor binding domain of the sars cov2 virus and the studies are on the way coming to nasal vaccine india is uh, ahead in this possibly uh, bharat biotech's vaccine bbv uh, 154 has been studied in mice hamsters and rhesus monkeys and it has been shown that this intranasal replication in deficient chimpanzee adenovirus vector can possibly lead to a benefit in two ways one is that it can give us a protection on the other hand it can possibly prevent the spread of infection because the vaccine is administered intranasally and that is the most common route of spread phase 3 clinical trials with 5000 volunteers have been approved by the dcgi and also the same vaccine has recently been approved for a trial to be used as a booster dose uh, in indian population other countries are not behind in uh, trying to develop nasal vaccines uh, this is a russian vaccine which is on the trial china has also done studies on the nasal spray vaccine and so does a finnish company which has tried to develop a nasal vaccine but the blind spot in this nasal vaccine is basically that the mucous membrane can harbor different antibodies and these antibodies can cross react with the vaccine and this is if we can cover this blind spot this will possibly be a very nice route the other discussion about a nasal vaccine is that whether we can combine with with a vaccine like a flu vaccine so this is a nasal flu vaccine which is comes by the name of flumist if we can combine it with a covid 19 vaccine and moderna is already on the way uh, they are starting early trials to find out a dual covid 19 and flu vaccine which would be a great help in people to counter two disease in one go also finally how nice it would be if you can put a patch like this buy it and put it in your uh, arm and then it gives us uh, vaccines so this has been already been uh, significant progress 
with this uh, patch vaccines where microneedle patches deliver DNA nanoparticles and it has been shown that they can induce specific antibodies against COVID and the most important part is that it has been seen to be stable at room temperature uh, without a decrease in immune response even at day 30. What we currently have, we don't have Omicron specific vaccines but homologous means the same vaccine we took before and the booster dose is the same or a heterologous COVID booster vaccinations has been shown to be effective in preventing uh, severe disease and this is what uh, led to people to think that whether we actually need Omicron specific vaccine again Moderna has started a trial where they have been trying to develop a booster which is Omicron specific and even Pfizer also is trying out a vaccine which is specific for Omicron and they feel that the vaccines could be ready as early as March and also our ICMS have batted for uh, Omicron specific vaccine strategy. So there is a website which is which you can track all the vaccines. This database is updated every Tuesday and Friday. This tells you how fast the vaccine development is going on. But what are the expectations of the people? People in India, still many of us feel we are we want an mRNA vaccine. Possibly many people still long for a Pfizer or a uh, Moderna vaccine, though we don't know. Uh, there's no head-to-head -head trial between vaccines. A COVID vaccine pill will be great, so as a nasal spray. And obviously, the patch would also be something which people would like to have in the pipeline. Because booster dose every six months may become a new norm. Although some people feel that by the time we get the vaccine booster for everyone, the third wave will possibly be over and natural immunity may be overtaking the vaccines. And finally, the most important expectation that the public has is that they can walk into a shop and buy uh, vaccines on their choice. At present, hospitals have been permitted recently, two days back, to buy vaccines and they can give it, but it's still not available in pharmacies. Uh, we can have time to choose our own vaccines, like uh, the, the, I should be able to decide which vaccine I want. And most importantly, children, children around below five years should be vaccinated uh, as soon as possible, and that would lead to a pandemic going into an endemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Mitin for that very nice talk and some very exciting new information that's coming on to the vaccine. I think one of the things that has happened during this COVID period is that science of vaccine has been dramatically elevated to a level where we can now produce vaccines at such short times and platforms like mRNA and think of variety of vaccines like the patch vaccine and all. I think uh, these are something that is going to become more and more feasible so that we are ready for the next pandemic and human race as such can deal with this very easily. I now request uh, um, Dr. G. V. Rao, Director of AIG to, uh, to give the concluding remarks. Uh, thank you for joining us this webinar on the AIG Omicron series. The entire aim of this series was to better understand uh, Omicron based on recent evidence regarding available tests, uh, manifestations both short term and long term in adults and children and also to share evidence based optimal management protocols that have developed across the world and also evaluated at AIG hospitals. I thank all my colleagues uh, at AIG hospitals for all these updates that they have done in the last two series. And we do hope that uh, this session of Omicron 2 from AIG Hospital was informative and uh, we are sure we will come back to you soon with more updates regarding Omicron and uh, the recent updates that are happening uh, from across the globe. Thank you once again on behalf of myself and Dr. Reddy at AIG Hospitals. We are signing off this Omicron 2 series from AIG Hospital.